Don't try to tell me we can't bring about real change. I'm a Philly girl. Don't tell me nothing that devalues my students, that dismisses my profession, that diminishes my voice, that threatens my power. Don't tell me we can't bring about real change. I am Becky Pringle, a middle school science teacher from Pennsylvania and the vice president of the largest labor union in this country, the National Education Association. Welcome to day two of the 2019 NEA Leadership Summit. Our theme today is leaders develop others by creating opportunities to build power. Developing others so they can build power. Hmm. It was January 8th, 2002. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act, ESEA, had been rewritten and was now No Child Left Behind. Oops, Lily, I'm sorry. No Child Left Untested. It was signed into law with an overwhelming bipartisan support. In response, NEA called an emergency meeting of state and local leaders from all over the country. I remember that morning like it was yesterday. A crowded hotel conference room, people standing along the walls, anger, and uncertainty filled the air. I had just been elected to the executive committee not six months before. And as I looked around that room at my colleagues, I too was uncertain. What would be our way forward, having been marginalized by our friends in the House and the Senate, having been promised that we see more money than ever in the coffers of public schools, that special education would finally be fully funded. As we gathered that cold day in Chicago, we knew. But what we didn't have a clue about was how much responsibility would be laid at the feet of our caring and committed educators. We didn't have a clue that we were entering this new era of blame and shame. We had not a clue that we were going to witness the defunding of public education leading to its very destruction. But we did what we always do, right? We got to work. We got to work. And we went to the RA that year, <clears throat> and the Representative Assembly, in its infinite wisdom, passed a new business item, calling for the creation of an ESEA task force. Now, it was unusual, the language of this new business item, because what they included in it was these words. Until ESEA is reauthorized. Now, normally it takes about five years or so to reauthorize a federal law. But this time, it took well over a decade. So, I got to lead others 
for a really, really, really long time. Because I was appointed to chair that ESEA task force by President Bob Chase. We began by reaching out to our members and listening to them, and not just them. We reached out to civil rights organizations and to our parents, um, and we asked them to work with us to answer this question. Just what is a great public school? Ultimately, we identified seven great public school criteria. They laid the foundation for the work ahead. That ultimately led to the creation of NEA's Accountability Task Force. And that task force actually created a compelling vision of a public education system where all students and all educators and all schools were succeeding and everyone knew it. The work that we had ahead of us actually resulted in creating more task forces and work groups, and I was appointed to lead those groups appointed by Reg Weaver and Dennis Van Roko and Lily Eskelson Garcia. Four presidents later, I had the opportunity to know that I was helping to lead others in their journeys. What I didn't know at the time was that I was actually using skills in our leadership framework to help me lead. You know, uh, last night you had the opportunity to listen to our amazing president and four of our remarkable executive committee members and one understudy um, talk about their journeys um, and their um, leadership of self. This morning, you'll hear other leader stories about how they went from leading self to leading others, mobilizing and power building to make a difference for their students and for their colleagues and for this country. Let's meet a few of your colleagues who are defining leadership for themselves and creating space for others to do the same so that they too can embrace that powerful preamble to our NEA mission that we, the members of the National Education Association of the United States of America, are the voice of education professionals. Our work is fundamental to this nation, and we accept. We accept the profound trust that has been placed in us. Join me in welcoming Karen Kovorkian to our stage. Karen <clears throat> is an English language arts teacher from New Jersey. Yay! Give it up for New Jersey. And um, Karen worked with her local and her state, the New Jersey Education Association, to partner with administrators and with parents and our members to share in the decision making around teaching and learning that has actually resulted in real outcomes for their students. So Karen, can you tell us a little bit about what sparked your passion around this work of collaboration? Sure, thank you, Becky. Um, educators are leaders by nature. We, we came to the profession because we believe in everyone's innate right to learn. Today I'd like to share with you my journey over the last five years of how I've learned to speak out um, 
to show that power of leadership for our profession. So it started with, together with my colleagues from Montgomery Township and others in New Jersey, as well as NEA, the support of NEA and NJEA, and Rutgers University. And we thought, how can we rethink the way that we approach education in general? And we want to better serve our staff and our students. So we thought we would try union management collaboration, which is actually a system for unions to give voice to their members. And our interest was not sparked by some crisis. It was sparked by a high level of frustration that our staff and our students were feeling. We had new teachers who would come for a year or two, and then they would leave for another profession. We had veteran teachers who had just stopped giving their voice altogether because they felt that the decisions had already actually been made. And so we realized we needed to shift our mindset from us versus them to us and them or with them. And we began the process of collaborating with our administration. So here's the premise. Decisions made together are more time consuming and they take a lot more courage, but they're sounder and they stay longer than those that are made universe, uh, unilaterally like the traditional top-down approach. It's the folks on the ground the ones who are in the proverbial trenches who know best how to work smarter, how to serve our students better. Always. Yep. And we know and we care, so we should and we must be integral to the decision-making process that affects our students and ourselves. So educators are leaders and we're advocates, and those require, those require voice. And I have found that voice is what union management collaboration has offered. So we decided to bring this idea to our school and we began by, by doing a couple of meaningful, uh, attainable projects that we worked with administration and staff together, and we found that we succeeded. What we did was we invited anyone who was interested, and to our surprise, about 20% of our staff was interested. We worked. By the end of the year, we had succeeded, and then subsequently, we took on more, more complex projects, ones that dealt more with teaching and learning. And during this process, the best part was that we found that our younger and um, newer staff decided to volunteer or run for union positions. They became keenly idea, um, interested in this idea of union management collaboration because they're a generation that grew up believing that their voice mattered and they wanted to add their voice to the conversation. And the other nice benefit was that our veteran staff decided to re-enter their voice into the conversation, so they came too. We needed to formalize this idea, though, of collaboration. We needed to institutionalize it so its future wouldn't be dependent just on the players, but actually on the system. So together, the union leaders with our administration set up some guiding principles. We wrote them together, and we decided um, how voices would all be heard and how we would go through decision making. And in the document, we added a final line that we borrowed from the folks in California that said, we will not let each other fail. And then we signed the document, not with our names, but with our positions. Mm. So our district in New Jersey is a, um, one of the leaders in the state in union management collaboration. Uh, several other colleagues of mine and in other districts have been trained in being facilitators, and we travel around the state, and we invite other districts to tell us their stories, and we sort of help them, and they help us too, and we grow the partnership. Every district has a starting place. Every district has some place that they can start. They can create a space to begin leading change, no matter where you start from. I'm here because I support the NEA's National Call to Action. I'm passionate about empowering my colleagues, about encouraging them to find their voices and use them. And I believe the best vehicle for that to happen is through union management collaboration. The future of our union can and should be in our own hands. Collaboration like any kind of authentic partnership is messy, it's not a straight path, but it's worth the effort though, because professionals shape the direction of their profession. Educators lead and we continually seek to move forward. So I'm so honored and grateful that you've asked me to share my voice here, so maybe other people would like to share their voices too. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Wow, wow. So we won't let each other fail. That is powerful. And the other thing you found that um, your, your union's power and strength wasn't, wasn't diminished. Not at all. When we say we won't let each other fail, we mean we still absolutely protect our members, but it's not the gotcha anymore. It's let's do it together. All right, excellent, excellent. So yeah, give her another hand. <clears throat> 
So now we have this young man, young man joining us on stage. He is Justin Johnson. Yeah, all right. You have some fans out there. And uh, Justin actually uh, went to NEA's Early Leadership, Early Leadership Institute. In a few short years, he went from that, an emerging leader, to a state officer. He is the secretary treasurer of the Georgia Association of Educators. So, so, and, and then, and, and you, uh, listen to his story. That, that's just, please, are you in school? What are you doing? Um, so not only did he do that, but he realized that he had to reach back. And so I'm, I want Justin you to tell us your story of actually building a pathway for other early educators to actually find their voice to go into lead, leadership and lead others. So great. Uh, thank you so much, Becky, for this opportunity. So I like to think of leadership as not just a pathway, but a skywalk. And so it gives an opportunity to kind of navigate your own path there. Um, so I think for me, the most important skill was the ability to mobilize uh, and organize and specifically to organize early career educators to become more active in the association. Uh, we accomplished this by creating our early career educator group known as the Georgia Association of Millennial Educators, or GAME, get in the game. We love our acronyms, <laughs> don't we? So the, uh, the idea came about uh, while attending my state uh, representative assembly. And so as I sat in that policy making body, I looked around the room and aside, beside from, from our aspiring educators, I was the youngest, probably the youngest active member in attendance. And so from there, I knew that it was my job to spark the conversations, but also begin the, the necessary work, to lead that necessary work to organizing others to help create a space for early career educators uh, in my association. So through one-to-one -one conversations and organized meetings, I began encouraging members to join GAME. And so the organizing work that was done through the Early Leadership Institute and the minority leadership training actually inspired me to eventually run and be elected as the secretary treasurer of the Georgia Association of <laughs> Educators. So Georgia, you're in the house, right? <laughs> so um, since serving in this capacity, I have been intentional in practicing the governance and leadership competency by creating spaces for early career educators in the areas of member engagement and leadership positions, uh, both elected and non-elected. Uh, we now have members of GAME serving on their local associations board, attending more training, serving as district directors on the GAE board of and delegates to both the GAE and NEARA. So for me, this is what is possible when you work with and lead others. Ooh, yeah. <clears throat> so, so seriously though, Justin, we have a lot of early educators that don't believe there's, there, there's space for them. Um, oftentimes told that they need to wait their turn. Um, so, Tell us a little bit about, you know, what it took, the courage for you to step up and say, I am a leader now and I'm going to lead. So for me, um, definitely being told, wait your turn, oh. actually fueled me. <laughs> so if you know anything about millennials, when you tell us we can't, we tend to try it <laughs> and do it. And so, yeah, so any millennials in the house, um, yes, yeah, so I just believe that I could do it. And I did it. And you did it. So the worst case scenario is I would win or lose. But hey, I, there was a 50-50 chance. All right. <laughs> Give it up for Justin. So anybody out there, do it. Do it. <laughs> um, seriously, though, you know, that's part of leadership. As soon as you get into a position, and even if it's not a formal position, which Justin um, really emphasizes with his, young, uh, with his early educators, as soon as you are there, you have to reach back and make sure someone is right behind you, ready to take your place. So that's an important part of leadership. Thank you, Justin. So now we have Miss Barbara Davis-Staley. 
Yeah, I know, yeah, she, she's fabulous. Um, <clears throat> so Barbara decided that she would retire from active membership in the association, but she did not retire from activism. She is now, I know, give it up. <laughs> she is now the president of the Texas State Teachers Association, retired Texas, you announced. <laughs> that is. Um, and she realized that her journey of leadership was not finished and started to reach out to early educators. So Barbara, tell us a little bit about why you believed you needed to keep and continue that leadership journey. Thank you, Becky. First of all, I never really considered myself a leader. <laughs> but some other seasoned teachers decided to invite me and say, come on to a local TSTA NEA meeting. And then they said, come on, let's go to the state convention. And as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> what pushes me on my journey is, after retiring from the day-to-day -day workplace after 33 years of teaching, <laughs> my desire to learn and to help others learn did not stop there. In fact, it made me more passionate from our profession. So I try to help those early educators as much as I can to understand the importance of belonging to a union and knowing their rights as an educator in this ever-changing education world we live in today. They need to understand the policies, the conditions, and the, imp the skills that impact our profession. And they need to impact, know that this impacts students as well. So I think that the NEA and its affiliates is doing a great job of advocating and for quality education. And they're teaching and helping us understand their role in advancing education in this uh, ever-changing world. So after a few years, some of you know that our early career educators decide to leave the profession. It's not, some leave because of the money, but most of all, they leave because of the politics involved in education. So with this, the TSTA retired, received a grant from NEA, and this grant partnered us with the uh, early career staff and organized the staff in uh, Texas. And we started with two locals one in Hayes County, which is right outside of Austin, Texas, and the other one in NEA Dallas. And what we do, we take a group of retired educators and we form little, little teams and we go out and we try talking to those early career learners so that they will understand how important the union is in their work. So that's what the retired group is doing in Texas. <clears throat> so, so Barbara, aren't, aren't you tired yet? <laughs> I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> but something just keeps pulling me back into it. It's because I have little nieces mm. and little cousins that are just starting out in the teaching profession. And I know when I started, it was easy. Teaching was fun. We didn't have all the politics. We didn't have all the paperwork. And I see them struggling with all the things they have to do. And so I do a lot of talking to them, trying to get them involved in the union. So no, I'm not tired. You're not. Not as wow. long as we have oh, students. Bye. Barbara, I can, I, I, can, I can almost hear you singing that, that old Negro spiritual, I don't feel no, no way ways tired. Oh, give it up for Barbara. Um, and for all of our, our retired leaders out there, I hope you've been inspired 
And for those of you who are still in active leadership, think about reaching back to your retired leaders and encouraging them to continue their journey. We need them. We need them. Yes, we do. So now we have Ms. Nikki Belknap. Uh, Nikki um, is a higher ed ESP leader from Oregon. Oregon, are you in the house? There you go. Um, Nikki uh, knew she always felt compelled to stand up for those who could not stand up for themselves. But it was a leader, another leader, that, that actually nudged her into a leadership and taking that next step. So Nikki, can, um, can you describe how uh, you um, felt in that moment? Um, because Nikki's actually a graduate of our uh, NEA Leaders for Tomorrow program. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, she's fabulous. Um, can you tell us um, how it felt in that moment to realize that you had this drive to continue to impact others and to help them build their own leadership skills? Yeah, thank you. The program lit within me the first real bonfire of possibility. I walked into the Leaders of Tomorrow program with strong fundamentals from my degree in leadership management and organization, but that was just a bag of tools, really. It took graduating from the Leaders for Tomorrow program to recognize within me my true potential. It taught me that leadership is a relationship and in that human connection lies the strength of the thread that pulls the momentum forward for everyone. Mm -hmm. My passion has always been to lift the voice of the ESP. My leadership journey has focused my sense of justice and will to act. It transformed my hesitancy into eagerness as I continued to reach out and seek new opportunities to practice my skills. As I took on new leadership roles at the state level, I began to develop my communication competency. I've experienced the power of compelling communication firsthand with our February 18th march on our state capitol. This was the first time I had ever marched for any cause, and it didn't disappoint. I even volunteered to don a bullhorn and lead some of the rally chants for the masses. I will never forget how incredible it has been to be a part of the revolutionary Red for Ed movement. I spent this fall and winter working on teaching other ESPs to develop their why and to use the full set of leadership competencies to drive their own growth as union advocates and as ESP leaders. We need each other as leaders. Budding new educators and seasoned professionals, each on our own paths, but hand in hand, binding our collective strength. Leadership is a journey without end. A momentary breath of air before heading further up the hill to see the next brilliant sunrise. And as educators, we know that continued growth takes a lifetime of learning. I'll leave you with my life's motto. Uskue kawakue kuero, melior refero. Always search for the better answer. Wow, wow. <laughs> Always search for the better answer. Wow, wow. Nikki, can you um, describe how it felt as an emerging leader, um, having just gotten trained yourself? How did that feel and what, it, what, what was it that compelled you to actually begin to work with others to build their own leadership journey? It was terrifying. <laughs> it absolutely was because I knew I had this set of skills, but I needed that, the, the people. I needed the, my team of ESPs from 2018 to be able to bounce ideas off of and to have that base of individuals that said, no, no, you got this. 
That's like so important. I rely on them every single day, even though we're from across the nation. But from there, I could understand that the voice of the ESP is not nearly heard enough. And it takes the courageous <laughs> to sit in this position that we are right now and say, no, you're going to hear us. It's that important. We are important. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes. And Nikki, we hear you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, my. Yay. So our, our, our last leader that we're going to talk to this morning is Ms. Caitlin Powers. Uh, Caitlin is from Bennington, Vermont. Vermont? There they are. <laughs> And she's actually working to build better relationships between the school community and the parents and civic organizations within uh, the community in, in Bennington, Vermont. Um, and she is working collaboratively to actually advance racial justice in education, um, in, in uh, supporting professional excellence of educators, and helping educators to find their voice. So Nikki, can you share your story um, and the passion around which you uh, made the decision that you needed to step up to this very, very difficult work? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you, Becky. Um, so there, uh, it was a small incident that started the dialogue in my community around race and how a lack of diversity and cultural awareness impacts teaching, learning, and living in Bennington, Vermont. So to provide you for, with a little bit of context, um, the decision was made to use the 1974 Newbery Award-winning book, The Slave Dancer, in the eighth grade curriculum. And if you Google it, you'll find that it's a book about a kidnapped white boy who plays his flute on a ship so that slaves could dance and stay strong. The problem didn't only come from choosing this book, and while the intention of using this book in the curriculum was not to cause, cause harm or inflict pain, feelings of pain or anger, it did. And it's 2019, and we have to do better for our students. Intent it's, versus impact. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and I don't know if uh, you watch Saturday Night Live, but there's even a skit about Vermont. Um, which inaccurately portrays all Vermonters as racist, ill-informed, and intolerant of other cultures. And this is not the Vermont that I live in, and it's time to change the national narrative. Mm. So, I firmly believe that every student has the basic right to be educated by caring and informed staff. I'm sorry if I get emotional. Um, <laughs> every parent has the right to send their child to a school that reflects and respects children, right? And we all have the basic right, I'll get it together. You're fine, you're fine. <laughs> Take your to time, live. take your time. Take your time. Just breathing those in. Those are tears for real children, okay? Take mm -hmm. your time. Um, but we all have the basic right to live and work without fear, hate, or harm. So this quote from the New York Times book review by James Baldwin really resonates with me, and this is why I, like, I was called to get involved with the racial, racial and social justice work. Um, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And that's what we're doing. So our community needed help. Our district really needed some guidance. Um, our local SWVA recognized that the union could help. And why was that? Because social justice is in every fiber of this association. And how? Because our union equips the nation's leaders or educators to be the best practitioners inside the classroom and the most fierce advocates outside the classroom. So from in the spring of 2016, when the then Vermont NEA president, Martha Allen, turned me from an interested onlooker to a fired up member activist, I soaked up every opportunity to help make our union make Bennington the better. And reading over the different leadership competencies, I believe that advocacy 
leading our professions and organizing are most applicable to the Bennington story. I've recently been appointed the racial and social justice coordinator for our local association. And that's really exciting. And what exactly that means is yet to be determined, but it's work that is necessary. We, we need to do it, and now is the time. Uh, and it's encouraging to read that leadership development is defined as a journey, not as episodic events, uh, because it definitely doesn't feel like we've done enough yet. And I'll emphasize yet. <laughs> um, at any rate, this work can't be done in a vacuum, and it definitely shouldn't be done alone. Uh, I attended the conference on racial and social justice last June in Minneapolis, which was exciting. Uh, I was there with one of my colleagues, Andrew Labarge, and we learned strategies for putting a racial justice lens on policy and practice. But just as valuable, training that's helping us engage the community for the greater good. And that's what we're doing. And it hasn't been easy. Uh, those of you that are in the classroom, like, it's messy uh, because we're dealing with real children and real families. and. Um, but we're dedicated and we're going to win the fight against racial inequity and ignorance in Bennington because that is not the Vermont that I'm from. And <laughs> dang it. <laughs> um, <laughs> educators, administrators, parents, neighbors, small businesses, community groups, together we will make Bennington the better. So stay tuned. <laughs> Oh, sweetie. <laughs> oh, that's my microphone. No hugging my microphone. Well, um, Caitlin, you know, share, share how you found the courage to have those courageous conversations about race. Well, it's my students, you know, and my colleagues that Everything, everything we do is for the kids that are in front of us. You know, I've taught sixth grade for seven years and, um, you know, 11 and 12 year olds and they're amazing kids and they all deserve um, an equal shake in this world or as like, close to it as we can help provide for them. And uh, like, they're the reason. Thank you, thank you. Wow. Um, so Caitlin is an example uh, of a leader that took on something as difficult as talking about race and did it anyway. Give it up again for Caitlin. And for Justin. And for Barbara. And for Karen. And for Nikki. Are they not fabulous? If you are not inspired by these leaders, I don't know what else we can do to inspire you. You've heard five very different stories of educators who are like you, who were compelled to act. What they all had in common was a realization that it was part of their professional responsibility to lead. They also realize that their leadership is a journey of learning and growing and action. These five courageous leaders are not only managing their current reality, but they're also finding ways to build power, to build power, to lead toward that aspirational future the transformation of public education and our union. At a time when opponents think we are weakened, educators, women, LGBTQ plus activists, communities of color, and our students themselves are rising up and saying enough, enough. We're finding our voice, we're realizing our power, and we're not backing down. We're demonstrating that we understand that elections matter. 
and that we can't stop there. Those in both elected and appointed positions of power influence everything that happens in our classrooms and in our work sites, everything that happens to and for our students. We know that our current reality cannot stand. It cannot stand. And those of us who intentionally made the decision to lead cannot allow it. So we must be bold and unapologetic, fierce and determined. We must fight for that compelling vision of an education system where all students and all educators and all schools are excelling and everyone knows it. This moment compels us to act. So we will not be silent. We will march and rally and vote. We will run for office and win. We will impact legislation until we shift that equity paradigm so students get what they need when they need it. We will fight for our communities so they are safe and their assets are celebrated. That's what we must do, NEA. As he recalled his experience making the decision to put his life on the line on that day in Selma, Alabama, Congressman John Lewis said that he knew in the moment that he had to get in the way of the Jim Crow laws that for far too long had gotten in the way of justice. And yet, we must get in the way of inequitable systems that allow some of our students to have every opportunity while others are told we can't afford it for them. We've got to get in the way. We must get in the way of that march toward income inequality and unfettered power that allows a system to continue to stand. NEA, we must get in the way of the sexist and homophobic and racist structures and practices that are allowed those people to belittle and diminish and destroy. NEA, we will get in the way every day, in every state, in every community across this nation because our babies, our babies deserve nothing less, nothing less from us. We will get in their way until they get out of ours. With righteous indignation, we will redeem the soul of America. Don't tell me we can bring about real change. NEA, we can and we 